I started working on it. Took Cyril's emulator for the uh, SDK basis. This came out, and now we have this. Yeah? And it's a long way. I ran. <laughs> a long <laughs> ways. So it took too long, but it didn't take too long. But it was it was it was some work. <coughs> I'm a freelance software developer. I spent a few years of my life with programming. Um, Small gear, small scale systems, Z80 um, controls and such. Then I switched professions. Still being a programmer, I programmed the HP non-stop systems. This is the, those are on the upper end of the HP offering, former tandem computers, big uh, big irons. And then, sometime later, I came back to the smaller machines, and it was fun. It was fun to do so. So what, what are, are we going to talk about? There are some prehistoric events. So the Open RPN project, Paulis, the main Paulis, the main developer, Paul Dale, he calls himself Pauli, so it's Pauli here, Paulis Forbanger. There were a few visual designs, so how should a new system look like or how how to arrange the keys, what, what, what possible uh, housings uh, we could think of. This is mainly Walter Bonin's work. Walter is a, almost a neighbor. We met one time and he came with his bike, so it's not too far away from me. And uh, a final word to the name. What is, what is the WP34S? Then back to the technical part, the ivory tower, the console version. You know what I mean if you see the pictures. Then next step, getting visual. That is, um, I picked up the SDK and made it with uh, the 34S sources. So you get a visual presentation, representation of what to expect if the machine ever would surface as a device. So it was hands on the SDK mating season, that is mixing and matching those both source trees and windows for everybody. One one point in time we had to go to the real hardware. So what what do we have with the uh, in the, those machines, the 20B and 30B? What's inside? A few technical details. What are the tools? I used to to compile the software and debug it. What is those ominous Samba thing? How can you debug such a software? And there were really some tricks, maybe dirty, maybe not, required to get this to work the way it works now. And it's not only the, the 34S, it's kind of an ecosystem. What a beauty salon is, you will probably already know the guy who is responsible for, for the beauty sits here. <laughs> um, those things can be connected to each other or to, to PCs. And there's a toolbox, and the toolbox author, Neil, will take over at, that, at some, some point in my presentation. And of course, there's a team. So I guess let's get back some years in time. Um, I'm not, not sure whether 2004 is correct, but it's in, in the vicinity. OpenRPN is an initiative to design and produce ultra high quality <coughs> calculator hardware and software for scientific professionals and advanced students using a community developed approach to ensure flawless operation. It's in quotes, it's not my text, it's from the um, Sourcewatch site. The original website is gone. Uh, maybe it will resurface soon. Um, it, <coughs> it was an ambitious project, building the hardware and the software uh, on a community approach uh, as a non-profit venture uh, compared to the resources a company like HP has. And I don't I don't want to say it failed, but uh, it never arrived at the destination. 
<laughs> Walter and Pauli were working on it. Uh, Pauli wrote some of the code. Some of the code still survives. The integer code in uh, 34S is one part of it. He told me that it's even more. I don't know the details. And Walter was always being responsible for designs. This is a keyboard uh, layout. This is a Voyager layout, if you count the keys. Uh, he sent me. It's vastly different, different from what we have now. And the main reason is that we were dream, or they were dreaming at the time uh, of uh, capable displays, which we didn't get. Okay, Pauli started three or well, four years ago with a RPN4 banger. This thing, it never surfaced the way it is shown here. This is just a visual design by Paul Wurtin. I found this on the museum site. Um, was meant to be fully programmable, had the same 16 digit accuracy we have now in 34S. It's the Decimal 64 library. Uh, it never existed as an emulator, as, uh, as a visual emulator, graphical emulator. It just was uh, a console emulation. So it looked a bit ugly and it didn't fit in a pocket. Uh, there were discussions of, about adding scientific functions. The you know 34S is full of scientific functions and that's a big part of the whole project, writing code. So you, you have multiplication, addition and some, some such. You know? And now you have to do a sign and an arc tongue and, and statistical functions. And there is a lot of effort put into this and this is mostly the work of uh, Paul with the help of some folks from the museum which helped to debug the code. What's now in the code base of 34S started here. So uh, much of the stuff of the, the state machine decoding the keyboard and um, executing programs, what is an opcode, how is it organized, started here. So I found an early posting by, by Paul. It was an answer to a posting by Walter, who showed an, one of his visual designs. And uh, it was in 2008, the 20B was out, and Paulie started to, to change his four-banger design so that it resembled the display of the 20B. So it was, in principle, it was possible to, to put this thing on a 20B, at least the display should um, should work. So he just had the same number of pixels here and same number of segments. It was still Baptist 42SN, so the name 34S uh, didn't exist yet then at that time. So here's a sentence uh, uh, statement by Walter. He, he changed my presentation, so it, I should have put it in quotes. Walter has created alternative layouts based on existing applied calculator housings for some years, often also, also suggesting improved displays. As this, is, this is a 20B from the housing, but with a hypothetical dot matrix with menus and such. You, you all know we didn't get this. Hmm? Um, kind of a dream that didn't come true. And still the name was 42S2, so the direction was to rebuild something like the 42, the dream machine of many of, of us here. Eventually, end of October 2008, Walter and Pauli officially joined forces, and I can shorten this. The uh, sentences in italics are interesting. If complex numbers are supported, do them like the 15C. If not, don't worry. We all know it didn't come out this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, there, is, there are no certainties during such a pro uh, project. This was poorly. Um, and uh, Walter's answer is funny. It may be the limited fun to do some lower level calc too. So we have a lower level calc with limited fun. <laughs> <laughs> and probably one more shift key here. I'd like to be free to add one more shift key. 
No, we have three. <laughs> mm. Things change. Here are some keyboard iterations. They have all the 20B housing and <coughs> SPay as the basis. It starts here, end 2008. This is early two, 2011, uh, still before I started on the emulator. And you see how keys change here. Here's an I key for the imaginary part. Here are even parentheses. parentheses. The last X, we don't have that on our machine now. It's there, but it's not called last X. Now, at some point in time, the, the shift keys moved in one row, how they, are now, how they are now. Didn't change much, but here you see on, on the H key. This is typical for Walter, who uh, does not know, in, know very much about the hardware. So that's only one way to, uh, to turn a 20B on. <laughs> this key here, that's hardware. You have to push this key to turn it on. Uh, no chance otherwise. And Walter th thought it might be a nice idea to have it here on this key. Sorry, <laughs> doesn't work. Um, some of you may uh, remember the discussion about an A key. All those designs here have the sigma on the top left key. Uh, and what, what we have now is an A. So, things in flow. So what about, in the, what about the name? This is the Ancaster, not direct Ancaster, but uh, it gave some of the ideas and responsible for the name is the 34C. Uh, it has even uh, less keys than our design has. So there must have been uh, gone much thought into arranging the functions on the available keys. No way for menus. So, but I think it was the tri tricky part is signing this one to get all the functions on the keys. <laughs> and um, what what the WP stands for, you should know. I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we thought about renaming it to WPMNE and O. So it would be Walter, Pauli, Marcus, Neil, Eric, and others. But marketing told us that's too long. Is it coming pink? Last year. Light, light pink and dark pink. Uh, now, why, why is this the ivory tower? The next page will tell you. But what you see here is what the 34S was before I started. It still exists in this uh, version. Uh, it's full of valuable information, valuable for Paul. It has a display area resembling the uh, actual 20B or 30B display. So there's probably only one person in the world who is able to operate that thing. <laughs> Paul, not me. And um, you need to know what the keys are. They are somewhere on the ASCII keyboard. F, G, and H have their meaning, but all the others are, okay, I, I don't know how to, to operate this thing. Uh, and you can't put it in a pocket, of course. Yeah. First thing I did to, to this is I introduced state saving. So, Pauli did something on the machine, on the virtual machine, stopped the program to debug it, started it again, had to enter his programs again and everything, because it had to complete amnesia, there was no state saving. The first thing I did is look at the code, what, are the, what is the data that should be preserved between power cycle? You don't power cycle that's such an emulator, but you stop it and start it again, so what are the, the what is the data which, which has to be saved and put that in a structure? Cyril so knows what I mean. <laughs> Uh, and the SDK wasn't the name my application. I found a different name for it, but it's essentially the, th the same thing, which can be written to a file, read from a file, so when you sp start the software again, you have your old state. And this is what happens in the emulator, in the uh, GUI emulator, and this is what happens in some sense on the real hardware too now. Hmm? And this was 
Come back. Hmm? This was H, uh, WP 34S for years. <laughs> Things changed for the SDK for Cyril. Thanks for that. Um, it is a graphical emulation on Windows, but it does not include the actual firmware. It's just a high-low game. And um, it contains project files for Visual Studio and the IIR compiler. And what is worth very much is the documentation. Schematics, LCD layout, keyboard layout, you have access to, to the, the source code, you can see what what um, what to do to, to, to scan the keyboard and such. It was very, very, very helpful to see that. I started yep, changing it. First thing, the keys are labeled differently. This was an early 34S design I got from Walter and I just merged the original uh, emulator graphics with the with the keyboard that uh, Walter sent me. It's still the old play, uh, game, huh? one of the high-low game. The SDK has some some implications. Um, to compile it, it uses classes from the Microsoft Foundation class library. So you need the full compiler from Microsoft for the emulation, emulator version. And uh, the project files for the real build were um, written for the IIA compiler, which cost almost 2,000 bucks. I didn't pay for the IIA compiler. I paid for the um, Microsoft compiler to have a starting point for developing a GUI. The Microsoft compiler is around five, 600 bucks. And um, I started working on it, changing the scans, uh, took a Swiss knife to cut the sources in two parts, so then I got the emulation part, the GUI part, and uh, the calculator part, so that I con could compile the calculator part or the uh, game part in this um, early stage with a cheaper compiler. The, the Visual C, C++ Express compiler from Microsoft is free. You can just download it. And this is all needed to compile the, the guts of the, uh, the, the uh, calculator emulator. And the rest is hidden in the library. Does it work? OK. On the 1st of March, I made contact with Paul and Walter for the first time and started porting or mating, mating for all sources with a SDK a GUI part, which didn't work uh, as well as I ho was hoping. You see the display? Mm -hmm. So it, it was just some, some an issue with the numbering the segments. So that was fixed very, very quickly. But I was lucky to to, I had made one screenshot to ask Walter and Pauli what to do with this, and I had I kept the screenshot so, so look, I can show it to you here. To you here. Uh, in the process, I replaced all the HP source files from the SDK and the 34S portion of the code, so the 34S portion does no longer include any uh, intellectual property, property by HP. The GUI part still does, of course. It's based on what Cyril has done, or his predecessors. And I managed to, to package the whole GUI thing in a, a dynamically linked library, DLL under Windows. So it's just a file you copy in your uh, executable uh, directory and have the GUI part, and the rest is an executable, sm much smaller executable, which can be compiled with a, a free version of the Microsoft compiler. It was it was a lot of work to do so because uh, Paul's original code was written with a ASCII keyboard and uh, 
a Unix screen in mind, and this looks this is looking different. This started something. It eventually started to work. It was announced in the museum forum, and things weren't different. Uh, were different thereafter. They weren't the same. And the reason is that now more people had something to play with. So the emulator, the, the GUI version, was real, really the kickoff for, for beta testing or alpha testing of the software. No, we, me, including me, I, I could not operate the console version. So this started intense discussions on the forum. Uh, many, many bugs were, were fixed. Things changed. Look at the A in the top left corner. <laughs> This used to be a Sigma. Um, we added functions. We streamlined it. it. It had still one problem. It was only an emulation. It was not the real thing. So one step was missing. Uh, this was on March 18, and I started the work on March 1st. So I was I was in a hurry. So what do we have in a 20B or 30B? It's a system on a chip by Atmel. It is. It can run fast. 40 megahertz is a bit, a bit more than it does. So 37 or 36, something like this. It can be throttled down to a few kilohertz to save power. You have not very much ROM. It's it's enough for a calculator. Um, part of the ROM. Uh, is lost when you power the device off. And we do power the device off to save power, to save on battery. It has a 128 kilobyte flash and a bootloader, which isn't wrong, so that you can reflash it with the proper cable. It has built an LCD controller. It has a very elaborate power management, so you can essentially turn on and off <laughs> almost every a uh, single bit in the processor to save power or in the, on the chip. You have multiple clock sources. Uh, you, know, you can uh, solder in a, a crystal, quartz crystal. You have a PLL to, to speed things up, so you have a multiplier. So you have the, the, the 32 kilohertz, and you can multiply it by thousands to get to 32 megahertz. That's how it works. You have a display with 400 segments. The 400 is uh, a limit uh, posed by the processor. It has control lines for 400 separate uh, segments on the display, and they are organized as written here, uh, the 12 times 9 segments for the Montissa, the 3 times 7 segments for the exponent, two separate signs, a dot matrix, and enunciators. If you add all this together, you, you get to the 400, and you have keyboard with 34 keys is a um, design six columns by seven rows. Not all of uh, all rows have the same number of keys. Uh, there are places in the matrix which aren't used. From the inside, I didn't take the filter. I'm unable to solder so nicely. <laughs> So if I took, would have taken a photo of mine that wouldn't have come out this way here. <laughs> it works, mine works. So you see the big blob, there's this, uh, the die, the, the trip. Those are all passive components here. Here is a content connector, here's a, uh, what is it, a 16 pin head soldered to, to the pins. You have to, to cut the, uh, the housing to get to this connector. So once connected, you cannot use it as an ordinary connector, uh, ordinary calculator, but you can use it to do the software on the hardware directly. Here are the pads for the programming cable. This is the reset. And here the, co uh, the, the crystal enlarged to see the actual soldering done. This is by Eric. This is my development system, sitting on a, on a, on a deck chair. 
is that uh, um, cell phone stand. What you see here is the, the flat cable going to the 16-pin to the head on the back and the Polymex adapter for hardware debugging. The adapter comes with a secondary serial port which I had connected to the cable. And here is an external power supply so I can power the thing from a wall out. That was necessary during development. One sad thing, it's broken now. I can no longer <laughs> flash. <laughs> I can no longer flash it through the serial port. One of the serial pins has a short internally, probably in the die somewhere. <laughs> I'm running all of this on an iMac, big screen. You need you need real estate on the screen to do such uh, such work. It's. Uh, on Windows XP in a Parallels Virtual Machine. Parallels is just a virtual machine software for the Mac. Pauli can build too. He doesn't, uh, it has no setup on, uh, of its own, but I have a, a server where I set up a, another virtual machine for him to, to access from Australia. So it's calling through the internet from Australia to my machine to compile this, the, the stuff. Uh, you need um, some more tools, of course. Visual Studio from Microsoft, I used the full version because I uh, do work on the GUI as well, but for if you want to compile the sources, Visual Express, which is free, is enough. To compile the, to, to the hardware, you need a cross-compiler for the ARM chip. This is currently a GCC 4.6 as provided by Agato.de. Uh, it's available for the Mac and for, uh, for Windows. Uh, you probably find the ARM cross compiler for Linux uh, free, so you can do it on Linux. Should be able to do it on Linux. I haven't investigated this. You need some more utilities to make the rank file work. Uh, this is written with, uh, or the make file is written with Unix or Linux in mind, so you need on Windows things like uh, a make, um, the shell, and of course a Windows C compiler for some pre-processing steps. You need Perl, Neil will tell you about this, why. Um, part of the code which runs on this system is written in the user code language and it's compiled with Neil's compiler during the build process. It's far from trivial to set all this up, and please don't ask me here, but yeah, I may write it up sometime, short documentation, what is needed. When I set up a secondary machine to build it, I just take one machine and copy all the stuff to the other. <laughs> it's easier for me than to, to do it from scratch from the installation first. This is the ominous Samba software used to flash the devices. It's provided by the chip manufacturer Atmo. Works best under XP. Works fine on my uh, em uh, virtual machine environment with an FTDI adapter. Other adapters have have proved to be problematic. If you have an old box with a physical serial port, that should work too. Um, also, version 2.10 will run under Windows 7. Yeah, I've got it to run under Windows 7. Okay, I don't have Windows 7, I can't comment on this. <clears throat> so what, 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 what is needed to get the software in a, in a Blanco 20, 20B? Here is one. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, they, are they, are, they are sturdy, they are sturdy. Don't worry, it's an HP. <laughs> okay. Um, an HP crashing on an HP floor shouldn't... What you need here is the special uh, programming cable Gene has done, and you need to erase it first. What erase? There is a certain bit in the in the chip which needs to be cleared to make it boot into the software which accepts the connection from the PC for reflashing, hmm? and the bit can only be reset on an on a device as provided by HP 
by clearing the whole flash, which clears the pellet, turn it on, connect the cable, start the uh, connectivity software. But you don't see the original firmware. It's erased. It blanks the machine completely before you can reflash it. What I've done on the 34S is a bit more uh, evolved because you can, it's a single bit in the chip which decides what, what to boot next, the bootloader for reflashing or the firmware, the actual firmware and flash. And the single bit can be controlled by the firmware itself and I've implemented a way to do so. It's a bit uh, tricky. I made it complicated because you can easily brick your calculator and if you don't have the cable, you're stuck. <laughs> Just, just there is a debug mode which I need for, for, for debugging, which disables all the power management functions or most of them. You can't debug with power, ma power management in place, and I used it uh, to to hide the Samba boot bit uh, reset function, just to make to make it a little bit harder to break your device uh, by just playing around with it. I assume you have the cable. Uh, I can do it with my cable. I have a different cable here. This doesn't look like the cable provided by by HP, and it works for for, for reflashing this device. If you are interested, I can show you. But this is a modified calculator too. Debugging is done from Eclipse. Eclipse is an open source development environment, original uh, conceived for Java. C++ and C development is uh, supported and uh, luckily you get all the, th the stuff in one big package. If you buy this Olimax adapter, this is what, what was the J J JPEG adapter. JPEG adapter, it comes with a software which contains everything, even the Elgato compiler. I just updated the compiler to the most recent version because it does a better optimization. You can uh, configure it so that, that Samba can be started from the within the EDE. And uh, if you, you can set it up manually, but just get the Olimax distribution, it's easier. Install it and you are, you are ready. This is how Eclipse looks like. On a big screen it's even more. You can't read it, I know. You see the uh, the code. This is a, a debug session, an actual debug session through the hardware. You can see the code. There is a breakpoint set and hit. Here you see uh, some internal information, uh, variables, and here what's going on between the, 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 the JTEC probe and the debugger here. Um, I'm not using it too often, but uh, when it comes to interrupts and some such, you need the hardware debugger. You have no chance without it. It's an editing environment which is at least as comfortable as the Microsoft IDE. I switch between both, depending on what I'm just doing. Some tricks are necessary to get this to work on the hardware. The hardware is very limited, especially the power supply, the two button cells. You can dry them within an hour or so. If you if you want to, to, to flatten your batteries, just go into Samba mode and let the system uh, sit there a while. <laughs> if you do this, just take out the batteries. <laughs> they, they, the chip draws 20 milliamps on full power and uh, the batteries are rated for 200 milliamps. You have two uh, milliamp hours. You have two of them. No, it's not. No, it's very easy to get them flat. So power saving is a is a big part of what has to be done. And power saving means that you have to turn the device off most of the time. <laughs> Cyril has done a very very good job, and he's he, he's convinced me, or Tim has convinced me, uh, to do it almost the same on 34S. It's a bit different, the scheme. I let it run for half a second on a low power mode before I switch it off, so, so I have a periodic interrupt which helps me to keep track of battery state and so on. So you don't, need, you, you don't have to push a button 100 times to get battery reading. You just have to, to, to let it sit 
for half a second you get a better re reading. Um, the, the, there were was, was some, prob some problems, so the internal 32 kilohertz clock did not work as, exp uh, as written in the manual, so I had to find some way around it. It was a, it was a, it was a dirty trick, but too detailed to, dis to explain it here. I need some periodic interrupts, or well, I decided to, uh, that I need them. And if you throttle the speed up and down and up and down, and you use the built-in timer, the timer periods are throttled the same as the speed is. So uh, if you go slow, the, the interrupts are like this. If you go fast, they are like this. <laughs> so to get a consistent time base for, for keyboard scan, keyboard repeat, debouncing, and some such, I needed a better timer base, and I found it in the LCD controller. The LCD controller produces an interrupt which is independent of the actual CPU speed. <laughs> you can use it. <laughs> it's much easier to handle. I have found some 50 bytes in the LCD memory uh, to, to, to save another few bytes, which can be used uh, for program steps. Otherwise, I had to put all this in the non-volatile memory, which is just 2K. Tricks, tricks, tricks. So the result is that we have a quite capable machine. Um, I learned how to write the flash memory from within the device. So I can put uh, stuff in flash. It's not restricted to the 2K of, of uh, RAM. Which is, uh, which is battery powered. In the battery powered area, we have the 100 general purpose registers, we have the four, 506 uh, working program steps where you enter your programs. You have an alpha register, you have flags. Uh, all the other program steps, read only registers, are in the backup and flash. You can simply make a backup of the whole 2K area with a button combination on and store it. You get your backup, you can take out the batteries, put it on the shelf, a year later you put in the batteries and it restores. <laughs> and you can even read those re registers in the backup with a command. And uh, you can have program steps in the flash which, are, which can be executed from flash, which results in over 5,000 program steps, which are all available to programs. So you can have large libraries, matrix software, or whatever you like you need. Put them in the flash region. The so flash region is of 1K size. And um, they are available to you. Just very much more than just the 2K you have uh, if you uh, restrict yourself to the ROM. So we have an ecosystem. It's not only the, the calculator and the firmware, you need, you, you need to label the keys. You can do it the way I did it. This was from my first development machine. It was a paper overlay. I cut out the keys, blackened them, and all the labels are around the keys, better than nothing. Um, Etienne, uh, Etienne, Etienne Victoria, uh, did it the other way, he labeled the keys, but he used white, what, what does he call it? A white, ugly white decals like, I, like the one I used because I was in a hurry, so. <laughs> it was he, not me. Hmm? Now we have Eric. <laughs> hmm? Just for him, this is a picture for him. The most, the, uh, by far most used keys on my development system is the, uh, the on key, for the on key combinations and turning it on and off and it wears off, as you can see here. So it might be fun to have a hardware produced by HP with the keys already labeled. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Uh, Neil has to, uh, has to tell something about his part. I showed you already the cable. This is my modified cable. 
and the modifications necessary. This is a three pin plug where I plug it in. Maybe more, tomorrow we have time to show how it works. You have communication. So we can put back and forth uh, programs between the PC or between two devices. We, we need the cable, the, the plug is the problem if you had. Uh, those plugs available, we could build crossover cables to connect to, to connect uh, two calculators, so you can send a library from one to to another. I skip this here. There's, those are the commands to to do the communication, and I hand over to Neil, which has written software for the PC to write write program with an editor. Neil, can you come? With an editor, and just to to help write readable, commented, well-commented programs, I start your presentation. Yes.